indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Adam. Um, we are to that point this evening uh, where we give an invitation for public comment. Uh, any interested audience member is invited to provide comments. Uh, we, you may speak on any topic other than a matter in litigation, a quasi-judicial land use matter, or a matter scheduled for public hearing at some future date. We will limit comments to three minutes per person for a total of 30 minutes. Uh, we have uh, public comment cards that have been turned in. If you'd like to speak, please fill one of those up and get it up to Melissa. Um, speakers cannot yield time to others in order to encourage an environment of openness, courtesy, and respect for differing uh, points of view. Please refrain from behavior that is disruptive to the meeting, such as making loud noises, clapping, shouting, booing, or any other activity that disrupts, disrupts the orderly conduct of the meeting, abusive language, will not be tolerated. So we have a number of individuals that have filled out uh, um, comment cards this evening. And so the first I have is Laurel Lindbergh. Welcome, Laurel. Good evening, uh, Mayor, members of the council. Uh, my name is Laura Lindbergh and I'm an administrator at uh, Parkland Village. We're an assisted living community here in McMinnville. Um, I cr we currently provide care for 50 residents, many of whom are dealing with um, multiple and chronic health uh, conditions. Um, I'm here tonight to uh, voice my opposition to your previous past ordinance uh, 5059 and support uh, for measure 36202, which would overturn the ordinance. I'm also here to ask you not to refer a competing ballot measure, which only serves to further confuse residents, staff, family, and voters. As someone who's lived in the community for decades, I believe very strongly that the voters need to have a say in this critical issue. A competing measure serves no purpose but to confuse the issue at hand. Let me also add that the ordinance itself um, has created an abundance of confusion for my staff, my residents, and their families. I've had numerous conversations with concerned family members who are nervous that their loved ones are put in jeopardy by the 911 fines. We are constantly reassuring families that we will call 911 when we feel it is necessary and that the fine will not dissuade us from providing the highest quality care that we can. I've had to reassure staff that our policies and procedures will not change. Resident health and well being is our highest calling. Finally, you've also confused the issue for your first responders, as many, are not, many of them are not aware that they are the highest ranking city official on site who must now determine a call whether it was justified or deserves a fine. This creates a strange and uncomfortable dynamic in a situation where the entire focus should be on the health and safety of the residents we serve. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question for the for the guest. I know that's unusual. Have you actually had any fines at, at Parkland? I have not. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Beth Jones. Hi. Welcome. Thank you for allowing me to be here. Um, I'm the administrator at for Crest Senior Living in McMinnville, which is a memory care and assisted living facility. Um, and I'm here on behalf of the residents and have a letter um, that after I read it, I'd like to submit as a, <clears throat> a matter of the record. Um, Mayor, Hare, Mayor, Mayor Hill and members of the council, we the undersigned residents of for Crest Assisted Living in McMinnville write to you tonight to express our opposition to your previously passed ordinance 5059 and support for measure 36202 as it heads to the voters. We also ask that you not place a competing measure on the November ballot, which would undoubtedly lead to confusion and seems unnecessary. We're very disappointed by the lack of engagement from city council with the senior commu community over these issues. There was no broad outreach to senior residents like ourselves 
senior citizen advocates, or the organiz organizations in which we live. Seniors, as I'm sure you're all aware, are an extremely active segment of the electorate. We show up and we want to be involved on issues that affect us. Your ordinance discriminates based on where we live and imposes taxes only on those in care communities, but not to those who are able to still reside in their own homes. We should not be punished. Many seniors who live in our care communities and others in McMinnville are on fixed incomes and the ordinance's additional costs will inevitably lead to an increase in the cost of care. There are better solutions to a city fi city's financial challenge than to balance your budget on the backs of seniors and those who provide care. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And about 50% uh, of our residents in the assisted living you give that to Melissa and she'll take that. Thank you, Beth. Gwen Dayton. Welcome, Gwen. Thank you, Mayor Hill. Council, it's good to be back. Um, my name is Gwen Dayton. I'm general counsel with the Oregon Healthcare Association. And I am pleased to come before you again today. First, I want to express our appreciation for the, the conversation that you recently had about outreach to us and working on this measure to make the ordinance to make it um, more productive. Um, I will say that we've, we've reached out to you multiple times to try to engage uh, and did not receive a response. Uh, we would have preferred to have done this before. I'm today. sorry, I, I just have to say, I, I at the last meeting did ask mm -hmm. for uh, you guys to reach out to me. I never heard a thing. So when you say that, mm -hmm. I, I just want to make sure that you're being accurate. Absolutely, Council. I will tell you, we sent a letter to the city in December, I think it was December 5th, that was sent to the fire chief and you all were, were copied indicating we had a number of questions about the ordinance. We received no response to that. We also sent out another letter. I should have the date with me, but I don't, but it was in the spring. We sent it certified mail indicating we'd love to sit down and talk with you all about this. We received no response. I'm sorry that nobody came by after our last meeting, which was just a couple of weeks ago, but we certainly have reached out to all of you. But that's not the point of my testimony. The point of my testimony is that we are glad to start again. We are glad to engage with you um, on the issues that underlie this ordinance, and we want to express our appreciation for that opportunity going forward as opposed to looking back. In particular, we appreciate the effort um, to consider some sort of a stair-stepped EMS ordinance, sort of like Portland, right? I, last time I was here, I talked about how uh, OHCA worked closely with Portland on their ordinance before it passed uh, to make sure that the processes and the criteria and the amounts and the uh, reflected um, appropriately the safety needs of residents against the needs of the city, right? And we were glad for that opportunity. Uh, we, we would look forward to working on those sorts of issues with you um, on the EMS criteria as well. Um, so we want to thank you for that opportunity, and I'm glad to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Gwen. Next, uh, Fee Stubberfield. Fee? Welcome, sir. Good to see you. Mayor. Fee Stubblefield, uh, 401 Northeast Evans, McMinnville, Oregon. And uh, it's good to be here. I uh, wanted to talk at the last meeting, but the hour was late, and I didn't want to come up here And when we all weren't at our best and, and uh, thought that there might be a, a, a better time that I could make myself available on this issue. Uh, sincerely appreciate, uh, certainly, uh, uh, Adam's uh, engagement uh, on this uh, issue uh, and appreciate the tone, Mayor, of revising and looking at um, the escalating the fees and maybe working with the industry. I, I can assure all of you this is what I do for a living. Um, I got into this because of the same reason that you, the very good, the very good reasons and purpose that you're approaching this ordinance, which is very genuine to, to affect quality care among seniors and make it better. That's why I do what I do. And <clears throat> so I can assure you that there are many issues here below the surface that can make this better and that in a cooperative way, not only the, the communities here in McMinnville taking care of residents um, and, and the, the people that uh, work in them, the people that live in them, 
uh, but the, the local and state governments, we could really have a big effect working cooperatively on this. And I think the Oregon Healthcare Association, I'm here representing myself, um, the Oregon Healthcare Association has the data, they have the skills, they have the knowledge, and are more than willing to help in crafting a very effective solution. And I would like to ask you to consider as you craft your message uh, regarding this, uh, this major to, to, to think about a couple of things. Um, the, the impact of the, the fines and the graduated fines can have a very good effect on, um, on some providers, right? The providers that may be challenged, providers that need to focus on this. There can be some very good outcomes, very positive. But I think one of the things that is, is troubling about the ordinance, ordinance 5059 is really the, uh, and for Mr. Towery's benefit, I'll call it the licensing fee, licensing fee uh, and the, or, the, the competing major calls it a tax, which we believe it is a tax. The struggle that that does and the amount of money that that gives for, for already doing inspections that are supposed to happen from people who are paying taxes where the real issue is here and the resources that it takes away from communities and their budgets and the administrations, particularly the Medicaid communities, the lowest cost residents, the lowest cost communities that are struggling and the fee is about half of what they get in reimbursement a month. But now you add on the licensing fee, which can be a significant amount of their budget. And I just would ask you to really consider, is this licensing fee, first of all, the concept, but then even draw, drawing it down to even the $100 level, is it really, really having the impact? Um, so with that, thank you. Thank you, Fee. Any questions? Future comments. Great, thanks. Well, this takes us to our first, our only presentation this evening, and that's a presentation on the three mile lane plan update. And we'll call on a planning director, Heather Richards, to uh, run us through this presentation. Heather, welcome. So good evening, Mayor and City Councilors. I wanted to bring to you an update on our current work that's underway at Three Mile Lane. It is an area planning work. It is work that's funded through a grant from the um, ODOT, from ODOT, Oregon Department of Transportation and the Department of Land Conservation and Development. It's about a $250,000 project and we're about halfway through it. So we thought it was a good time to come and update you um, with what we're doing there. Um, I think this is a great picture. I like to show this because it represents old and new in the area and it's very representative of McMinnville. So if you look at the Jackson Wine uh, distribution center that was built just behind that old um, farm cellar there, they tried to design their roof line in such a way to represent the old farm cellar to, to really put homage to the agricultural traditions here in McMinnville. And so it's, it's showing that juxtaposition and that's something we want to continue to do as we work in this area and combine old and new and really sort of show distinctiveness for McMinnville as people travel through on Highway 18. We do have a website set up for this project. It's www.3milelane.com. That's where we're posting all of our um, documents and any progress on the project if people are interested in following along. So the area plan itself is really a high level plan, high level master plan for this area for Three Mile Lane, which is essentially Highway 18 as it uh, travels through McMinnville <clears throat> from the eastern side to Three Mile Lane. Um, it's bounded, it has a lot of development on the northern side. The southern side of the highway though has a lot of vacant land, which is interesting for McMinnville when we have lands constraints and are struggling with finding land for development opportunities. There's a lot of vacant land south of Highway 18. So we asked ourselves a couple of years ago, why, why is that? Why hasn't this land developed? That was the first question. The second question was, how can this area um, with so much land ready for development serve this community in the next 20 to 40 years? How can it sort of set the foundation for the future of this community? And is there something that we should be doing in terms of master planning to ensure that it's, that it's moving in the direction we want it to move as, as a community? Um, 
This shows, this is an area that shows development. The other interesting aspect of this particular area of McMinnville is that the properties that are vacant are large contiguous properties. Um, so the owners, you don't have, to, ownership isn't disparate. There's opportunities for someone to come in and really make significant impact here. And then it's also adjacent to the city owned airport, which also has a lot of um, opportunity land associated with it. There are four goals for this project. The first and primary goal is economic vitality for McMinnville. Um, there's also a goal of ensuring that there's a mixture of land uses in this area um, that is diverse and vibrant and really represents McMinnville well. Um, the third goal is to enhance multimodal connections. So what that means is really looking at all different ways of creating connectivity for people to from, from and to this district for both vehicles, for pedestrians, for bicycle and transit. And then goal four is to create an aesthetically pleasing gateway to the city of McMinnville. So more people travel and see McMinnville on Highway 18 than any other corridor for our community. So this is a great opportunity to really make an impression of what McMinnville is uh, for the people traveling through. We're building on existing plans, so there's been a lot of study in this area, and we want to make sure we're, we're bringing that forward. So we're, we are building on existing plans and also current efforts underway. Uh, we're about halfway through the project. So this is an 18-month project. We expect to have it concluded by May 2020. What we expect to see at the end of this project is an uh, area plan that would come to you for acknowledgement. And that area plan should show suggested land uses, potential rezoning, uh, any sort of development code that we want to enact to ensure that the, that the vision for this area moves forward as the community uh, would like to see happen. There's a lot of documents that have already been uh, generated for this project, and so those are on our website. If you're interested in them, I'm just gonna give you a snapshot of some of that uh, in this presentation. The first thing we did is we looked at existing conditions uh, in terms of land use and zoning in the area. This is the comprehensive plan, so it shows uh, the different types of land uses that we have out there. Just to give you an example, all the different colors are representing different land uses. So there, there are a lot of different distinctive land uses happening in this area. Um, it also has uh, several major property owners, as I, as I suggested. So um, there's an opportunity to bring the property owners together and talk about what makes the best sense for development moving forward so that we can ensure that it's all leveraging against each other and enhancing each other. We identified different areas in terms of sub areas. So there's activities taking place just, for instance, north of Highway 18 where the Space and Aviation Museum is and a planned hotel and the water park. That's really becoming a tourism activity center, especially with the RV park next door. And then south of there, there's the airport and then there's the large industrial lands. And then just uh, towards the west side, we start to see residential development occurring on the north side of Highway 18. And then on the south side, we have some medical development. So there's a lot of different activities taking place in the area. Uh, this is representative of what that looks like in terms of the different landscapes that are happening there as well. It's actually a very interesting area geographically. It has some of the best views of uh, mountains, uh, the McMinnville Mountain view sheds that we have here uh, in all surrounding McMinnville. Uh, and then this shows the different types of neighborhoods we have there. So we have some high density neighborhoods that are occurring with the Habitat for Humanity uh, neighborhood and with community home builders. We have some, we also have some existing large lot neighborhoods that came in from the county when we went through an annexation process. Uh, we have Shemetica College over there, and then we have some uh, new multifamily that's being developed as well. There's a lot of opportunities with the land to do things, to start thinking about how these different uses play with each other and what are some of the refinements in terms of amenities that we need to bring to bear to put all these puzzle pieces together. Joe Dancer is just a, 
Joe Dancer Park is just adjacent to this area, so there's opportunities to look at how to interact with that, how to create better neighborhoods that are happening there and, and um, bring these different subdivisions that are being built into a sort of comprehensive neighborhood that interacts with each other. And then there's a lot of natural features there as well. The Yam Hill River uh, bounds this area on both the north and south side. Um, we also have the Galen McBee Airport Park in this area, which is a unique park for this community and beautiful uh, view sheds to the south over agricultural land. In terms of transportation, uh, it's really an area that serves the vehicle. Uh, we've been doing, a lot, this is partially funded by ODOT, so there is a lot of transportation study in, in this area planning process. And so looking at counts of how people are moving around in the area, it's clear that um, it's a very vehicle, vehicular dominated. So we don't have a lot of pedestrian and bicycle activity ha occurring there. Um, it's mostly vehicles and not as much freight. I was actually surprised that uh, the freight counts that were on on Highway 18. We looked then at the pedestrian system to understand what the system looks like and where there might be some vulnerabilities. Uh, green is good in this network and red is uh, stressed. And so you see that there's a lot of stressed network for pedestrians in the area. It's mostly along Highway 18 and then the, and then the three mile lane bridge. The same is true for bicycles. So you see the same system here uh, in terms of the stress network for bicycles. And what that's saying to us is we've got to do a better job of, of creating a network for people to get around in this sub area, both on the north and south side, uh, from a pedestrian and bicycle perspective. And then we also need to do a better job of creating connectivity to the rest of the community, so across the river into the city center. Uh, the transit system is just beginning to grow in this area, so it serves the three-mile lane area. It doesn't serve it significantly. There is a fixed route system. It's, um, it goes all the, it goes to the college, but it doesn't go beyond that. It doesn't have it's not doesn't have a high frequency in terms of. Um, how often it is t uh, transporting into this area. We do have some um, affordable housing developments here where we, and we also have the Virginia Garcia uh, Clinic as well as Physician Medical Center in the hospital. So we wanna we want be thinking about how can we do a better job of providing connectivity for people who need vehicular access but don't have their own vehicles to do so to the amenities here. Um, what's interesting, though, is uh, in terms of the vehicular network, it's actually in a fairly good position. So sometimes when cities go into these area planning processes where the city is built on both sides of the highway, you start to see a lot of um, conflict in terms of the intersections. But because of all the work that this community did in the 90s and put together a 1996 Highway 18 management plan where there was a conscientious effort to really control access and start removing access to highway Highway 18 so that you start preventing the conflicts. Um, we actually have some well-built intersections that still have uh, capacity at them. Um, and then we also are showing, when we look at safety evaluation, this is hard to see, but red dots are where you've had um, significant accidents and then uh, yellow is moderate. And there isn't a lot of red in this highway section for a highway of this nature carrying this many vehicles. So that's actually a very good thing. So the work that McMinnville went through in the 90s to put the, together that Highway 18 plan, the initial one, really did its job. It created a safe environment. Now we're just taking it to the next step to figure out how do we make this an area that serves the community in terms of economic vitality and moving into the future. So the economic analysis, part of our consultant team is Leland Consulting. They're well known throughout the state for economic analysis and they looked at where, where are the opportunities um, in terms of new development in this particular area. They drew a market area that's larger than McMinnville and that's typical when you're looking at a market area because you have a shed that you're pulling from in terms of a consumer market. And then looking at that, they sh they uh, discover that McMinnville is a commuter city. So although we bring a lot of people in to work in McMinnville, we also send a lot of people out of McMinnville who are living here to work elsewhere. 
This shows the home locations of the people who are traveling to McMinnville to work. It's interesting because if you look at this, we have a lot of synchronicity with Salem. So Salem is the, uh, down there on the uh, lower right. And that's where we're, we're drawing a lot of employees from Salem. But when we look at where we're sending people, so people who live in McMinnville and where they're working, we are sending a lot of people to the Portland metro area and then also to Salem as well. We looked at development activity in this area um, since 2010 relative to the rest of the community. So anything you see that's surrounded in a black outline is something that's occurred since 2010. McMinnville hasn't had a lot of significant commercial and industrial activity since 2010, um, but you can see it's fairly proportional what has been occurring. So we have seen new development in the three mile lane area as well as in the uh, industrial park, the larger box you see there is the Jackson Family uh, Distribution Center. Are the numbers in that slide uh, square footage? Yes. Uh, we also looked at apartments data because we wanted to understand is there a market for apartments in McMinnville? And even though what's interesting is even though we have a very low vacancy in our apartment um, uh, in the apartment product that we have in McMinnville, we still aren't commanding a high enough rent, ironically, even though it feels like we're in an affordable housing situation right now, that is um, being able to be financed into building new apartments. And so uh, we are seeing that there are people who are looking at apartments, trying to pro forma them and put them together, but it's not something that the market's immediately responding to. What we're finding out is those who are building apartments are those who have a large portfolio and are able to leverage effectively and we have two apartments underway that way so I'm sorry I didn't I didn't I didn't fully follow that you were saying that that um, few apartments are being built because the price point for the rentals is too low in the community to support the cost of construction. So um, once you get over a certain height in terms of uh, building construction, you're into a whole different type of structural code. It's more expensive and the, and the market rents aren't supporting that financially. We're still seeing more of the sort of smaller uh, 12 unit structures for apartments as well as townhomes that are being built as high density, uh, but we're not seeing the, sort of the large, you know, 20, 50 unit apartment complexes. Thank you. However, with all that said, uh, looking at a 10-year residential demand, we do have um, need in the community and we do have projected growth. And so we tried to assign that into this area to understand how much um, residential growth we could capture in the Three Mile Lane area. And after doing some market research, Leland Construction's recommendation is that we could probably handle about 200 plus new apartments in the area in terms of market, um, 100 townhomes, and then single family as zoning permits as, as it's currently zoned. We then looked at retail spending, and this is where there were some aha moments uh, for the group as we were working through this. So we do have a project advisory committee comprised of community stakeholders um, who are both residents and business owners and property owners in the area, as well as at wide community members uh, working on this. And um, looking at, um, Leland has access to some data sources that aren't public data sources, so we don't have access to those as a city unless we pay for them. But they were able to generate what retail leakage looks like in McMinnville. And the surprise, the two surprising parts are, so the red is what's leaking out of the community. Uh, if you look under general merchandise, we're, we are leaking close to $100 million a year in general merchandise. So people are going to, I'm assuming, Salem and the I-5 corridor to do shopping, whatever it is. Um, and then while they're there, they're also eating because we also have a significant amount of, of financial financial leakage in terms of food and drinking places. So what that means is there's opportunities to capture that money back into the market. If people from McMinnville are leaving McMinnville and spending that money elsewhere, that's, that's a business opportunity for someone to come in and try to capture that back. Oh, and so with that, uh, Leland Consulting felt that we could absorb uh, in terms of general merchandise, large format, 
um, stores, at about two stores for that. Food drinking places, they feel we can absorb about 10 more uh, in terms of our market, uh, and then clothing, um, three plus stores. So they, in the analysis, they go through what they feel the market can absorb in the different types of um, stores for that. The other thing that's occurring is, you know, there is a, um, there is some anxiety about big box. So there's a lot of discussion in this community about whether people want big box or don't want big box and that anxiety exists. Um, and clearly people are leaving the community to um, spend their money elsewhere on some of that big box shopping. And we wanna capture that here and how do we do that in such a way that's appropriate for McMinnville. But the but the industry itself is all, is also in, in an angst position because of what's happening with e-commerce. And so looking at all of that, we still recognize that in the future, people are still, still gonna be going out and spending money in physical storefronts because they're looking for experiences. So as we get more and more um, involved in our technology and our lives become more and more involved in our technology, we are still gonna seek out interaction with each other as experiences and, and there'll still be a commercial market for that. And all this leads up to what we feel, you know, could be the future for this area in terms of how it how it serves the community. The office market in McMinnville is interesting. Um, it's very tight. We don't have a lot of office space. We don't actually have any dedicated office zones here. We don't have a business office park. Um, and if some of the numbers will show that we may not need office space because we're not generating that interest. However, we also have just in the last two years we've had. Three three large businesses who are local businesses that are growing um, and doing very well, so good, thank goodness for that, who struggled to find space for their growing business. And actually all three of them located out in this three mile lane area um, as the evergreen office buildings became available. So we were able to keep them in our community because we had that built stock, but we don't have any additional built stock for that. And we don't have dedicated space for that type of office environment. And as um, as we, in terms of the future growth of office, the office market, the, it is looking for experiential campuses. So people want to locate somewhere where they're providing a good experience for their employees. Um, and so making a conscientious effort as to how you set the table for that is something that cities are talking about and doing. And so with that location of those three businesses in the three mile lane area, we've had a lot of discussion about that's sort of the start and we can build upon that and start creating those amenities there. I have a question to jump in and it could be a earmark for something later, but okay. I'd love to learn more about currently what our efforts are for marketing us and that experiential package. I know we have a couple of organizations doing different things, but for later, maybe as a body, as this body, I'd like to hear more about what our current efforts are. Okay. And what those look like. And I think MEDP has a presentation for you very shortly in the agenda items. But uh, if you have questions specific for me, I'd be happy to answer that. But, and I, I don't know if the fee is still here, but he is one of the businesses yeah. that located out there. So that might be a good question for him. Uh, in terms of industrial space, uh, that's also very tight in McMinnville right now. So we've had um, our vacancies have gone declined almost to zero um, when we were at 16% vacancy in 2014. So our speculative buildings have all been filled in. People are expanding their businesses or they're trying to find either new space to expand into or expanding their existing footprint. Um, and so, and that's usually this, uh, they're looking for smaller acreage. So I talked about how Highway 18 has some really large contiguous properties. It has two 90 acre properties. We don't have a lot of the fives and the tens and the twos uh, in terms of industrial land available here in McMinnville. And we don't have a lot of speculative building either. And so there's a lot of discussion of where is the best place to put that. And then obviously tourism is a growing market in McMinnville and doing very well. We have a, a tourist commercial zone. We have about five acres zoned into our tourist commercial zone. And so we're, we're looking at that and thinking, how do we serve that industry better as we move that forward into the future? So the anticipated development mix for this area that we're looking at is residential, um, multifamily in terms of townhomes and garden apartments as the market will serve that right now. Doing some sort of mid to large format retail 
retail, gen the general merchandise that is in terms of the leakage that's occurring, but doing it in such a way that it's experiential, so experiences and special to McMinnville, not, not your you know, generic forum center. Um, looking at low-rise office opportunities in terms of a business park, doing craft industrial um, as part of that McMinnville experience and mixed-use commercial, as well as lodging and hospitality. There's been a lot of public engagement in this. I talked about the advisory committee that's been meeting. Um, we also have had a couple of uh, public outreach opportunities that have been well attended. And then we've been working uh, independently with the property owners that are in this area. We brought together the property owners that have the large contiguous area of industrial land south of Highway 18 and visit with them about how do we master plan these um, so that as these properties develop, they work with each other and really leverage effectively. And they haven't all been together in a room like that talking about what their vision is for their property in the future. Uh, so it was a great opportunity to do that and we matched them up with our consultant team and, there, and there's been a lot of uh, really good conversation that's come out of that. We will have a a master plan that the consultant team will deliver to them as a potential for them to consider moving forward. Part of that process was looking at what are the opportunities, and that's where we started having the discussion of the view sheds that are in this area and, and all the all the different property opportunities that may, many people probably don't realize exist because they're just looking at highway frontage. Um, this is a picture, I'm sorry it's so dark, but we brought the project advisory together, committee together and did a design charrette for this area that was really well received. Uh, we did a, a public open house and we also did a survey as well that were both well received. At the public open houses, we're getting about 100 plus people coming to those and engaging with us. And then just recently last month, we had a town hall and did a charrette again with um, neighbors that were uh, in the area. So what this all leads to is we're developing what we call a preferred option for both transportation and land use. And then we will take that preferred option and put it through a detailed analysis as to what does that mean for the transportation infrastructure to support those land uses and the development code that we need to incentivize them. So to go through those really quickly with you, um, there's common elements. So we can't move the UGB boundaries in this effort. So they remain the same. The airport lands remain the same. And um, the local roadway designs are adaptable to any land use concept. So the right of way is there and they can serve the land use concept on the frontage. Uh, in terms of transportation, uh, some of the common elements is uh, connecting Cumulus Avenue to Southwest North Lane through or adjacent to Shemetica Community College. Uh, looking at more complete streets, that means more streets with bicycle and pedestrian amenities. Uh, improving Three Mile Lane Bridge for bicycle and pedestrian safety and you're going to have a presentation at your next city council meeting from the ODOT project manager for that project. Uh, and then uh, new and improved bicycle and pedestrian connections throughout the area. That's been the number one um, wish list from the public as we've gone through the public outreach process is that connectivity. Urban design, how to take advantage of what's unique to McMinnville and what's unique to the area. And then the parks and trails. There's natural features here that are beautiful in terms of the Yamhill River, uh, Galen McBee Airport Park, and the ability to connect with Joe Dancer. We put together three different alternatives. We brought it to the committee and the public and you have those in your packet. Um, and what happened was they took all the best pieces of all three and put together this last preferred alternative. And this looks at doing a um, tourism uh, area up by the Space and Aviation Museum. So rezoning that into tourist commercial and really looking at how that can serve a tourism industry. And then it takes those two large properties uh, that are south of Highway 18 and looks at a um, opportunity for retail that's frontage to Highway 18 and then a corporate campus behind it that sort of creates that craft industrial, the smaller industrial spec space, but also an opportunity for a business park that connects with the existing business park that's occurring out there. And then it looks at um, better connectivity for the residential neighborhoods on the um, northwest side. In terms of transportation, um, they, the consultants brought two options for that. One was full interchanges at the existing interchange um, at Three Mile Lane, and then also another one at Cumulus Avenue and a roundabout at Cirrus Avenue. 
uh, and the, the first part of the existing interchange is to make it more um, friendly to get into McMinnville. So right now when you exit off of Highway 18 there, it's a little difficult to find your way to McMinnville off the exit. Um, and so we're so the first thing would to do would be to reorganize that so that it's easier to get into McMinnville itself. Um, and then looking at what an interchange would look like at Cumulus in terms of um, land consumption as well as uh, transportation effect. Because we're looking for bicycle and pedestrian uh, connectivity, um, this would not allow connectivity with the interchanges across north-south, so there would be overpasses for, that are dedicated to bicycles and peds. And to do that, you actually are sinking the highway down a little bit, so you're not creating this huge arch that people have to go over. And so it created a sort of grade differential between the local street network and the highway. The committee wasn't thrilled with that design option. The other design option was three roundabouts, so Cirrus Avenue, Cumulus Avenue, and Norton Lane all being roundabouts. The roundabout discussion came because there's a planned roundabout on Highway 18 just outside the city in the county. Um, and again, that was looking at you know uh, fixing the interchange, and then the thought was maybe it would be better in terms of traffic flow, uh, getting connectivity to emergency connectivity to the hospital, and land consumption would be less. However, it's still fairly problematic in terms of functionality, and so again, the committee did not think that was a great idea either. So they put together a hybrid of those two that you see. Uh, had a lot of discussion of do we need interchanges right now? Could we improve the existing intersections that are currently working and still have capacity and build them in such a way that they could have more capacity but still operate that way with full turning movements? Um, and so the uh, preferred alternative that's come out of this is fix the interchange at Three Mile Lane and then do signalized intersections at Norton Lane and Cumulus and a roundabout at Cirrus Avenue. So the next steps are those two design alternatives, the two hybrids will be put through this sort of deeper analysis by ODOT and the Department of Land Conservation and Development. And then in the fall, we'll bring that analysis back to the um, project advisory committee and we'll do a public event to say, what does this mean? Can this actually work? Does the transportation support it? And from there, we'll move forward with our deeper dive into development code and the area plan. So with that, um, we just wanted to make sure you were updated on how that's moving forward. A couple of your counselors are serving on the committee with us and participating in the design discussions. Any questions for Heather? Adam? This might be uh, the cart in front of the horse, but on some of those larger industrial lands, is there any like large utilities already currently at those that would support a large retail tenant like Costco or Best Buy or any of the other leakage that we've been seeing? Um, so Mac Water and Light is looking uh, to, to put in a substation, in the substation, right, in this area? I can save that question for the next presentation. <laughs> That's right, the next. <laughs> um, so Macwater Light is looking at improving their utility out in this area. They need to anyways, and they're looking for a site to do so. Our wastewater capacity, we'll be working on updating our wastewater facility plan as we go into some growth analysis. Um, right now, it's set up to serve the existing uses. I, we think it could probably serve this preferred alternative, but um, in terms of the amount of housing that would go in there, if we, if we went further than what was suggested by the consultants, we may have issues in that regard, especially south of Highway 18. Thank you. But we'll, we'll do more work on the utility piece of it after we get through this analysis. Okay. Other questions? Thank you. Thank you, Heather. And again, you know, as we continue through this process, feel free to drop in on any of the meetings. They have been just fabulous, very good engagement um, with the property owners, the business owners out in that area. And I think we've made tremendous uh, headway in just uh, visioning what it could be with input from our community. Uh, Residents. Yeah, I hope I'm sending it to all the city councilors. Mm -hmm. um, if, if we have more than who's on the committee come, let me know because we have to notice it. Uh, 
But um, one thing I've got gathered from this is people want to participate. The charrettes have been very well received and people have been very interested in having the opportunity to sit down and participate and be heard and be part of the process for what the future looks like. So it's been a good experience. And thank you, Heather. <clears throat> Uh, that takes us to our advice and information items this evening um, and reports from counselors on committee and board assignments. Um, I think I'll uh, start with Zach. Thank you. Um, pretty slow. I missed the last landscape meeting um, and historic landmarks committee, our KOB, Technical Advisor Committee is coming to a head and Susan, Adam and I, as well as staff are putting together our presentation to council on our recommendations. In fact, one of our KOB TAC members is here and uh, we'll be bringing that to council and giving some good direction. So that's my major update. Thank you. Wendy. So we had a great Muroc meeting. Um, we uh, had a nice presentation. Uh, we looked at um, the uh, development that's gonna be going in on Lafayette. Um, they're moving forward on that. They're actually, one of the things we were considering was uh, initially when we put together that Northeast Gateway, we had decided not to allow drive-throughs on Lafayette. But we had a long discussion about that. And one of the things that makes it financially feasible for them to complete um, the um, development that they're looking at doing is um, is to have, in addition to pedestrian friendly, also having a drive-through option. And so the, the committee talked a lot about that. And we decided with some conditions that that would be okay on Lafayette since it's a different part of town. So that will be coming back to us later. Um, and. Uh, we um, looked at a number of other things during the meeting um, that uh, will, would move forward a couple of other projects. Um, drawing a blank on what other uh, The things. boutique. Oh, the boutique we looked at. Uh, the, that's right. We looked, uh, talked in depth about um, the uh, mini houses and the designs of those. We did decide not to um, move forward until we had a little bit of additional information. We wanted to see more um, of the design, more detailed designs because we just have conceptual drawings um, and um, some additional information about parking. Uh, right now we don't have requirements on parking, but we can ask for more information about how, what their parking plan is. And so we were a little bit concerned about that. Um, so we decided to ask for additional information before we decided to move that forward on that. So, um, that's my, did I miss anything else? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Scott. Thank you. Uh, Adam? Uh, Wycom, we didn't have a meeting July or August. Looks like we probably won't have one September. So we'll probably have a busy October. Um, Airport Commission, we looked at the Comcast lease, which is in the packet for this evening for consideration. The air show's coming up in September. On the website here, it looks like there's still some general admission tickets and uh, a little bit of reserved seating left on Friday night, but Saturday and Sunday's sold out. So um, if you're looking to go, and then there's some more expensive presidential and beer garden seats. So it uh, should be a good event. Hopefully it um, goes as smooth as we all are planning for it too and doesn't put any undue stress on Chief Scales or the other city staff. Um, outside of that, I would like to highlight our newly uh, promoted captain, Barth Stody, in the back room there. Thanks for joining us. And uh, there's quite a few others that got promoted and sworn in as well. So maybe stop by the fire hall and wish them all well. <clears throat> Thank you, Adam. Sal? Pretty light report this week, uh, Mr. Mayor. I did um, stop by today uh, and visited uh, Agulix. Uh, you might recall in December we uh, started uh, styrofoam recycling, and Agulix is the vendor that converts that styrofoam into plastic, and they're expanding their operations uh, significantly. Uh, and so I had an opportunity to kind of go see what they're all about, and uh, that was really interesting and I think we're going to see some great things in uh, in plastic and styrofoam recycling both in Mac and around the state um, 
coming forward. Uh, Mid Valley Cog uh, September meeting is canceled, or excuse me, August meeting is canceled, so we won't be meeting again until September. Um, I'm planning on inviting uh, the uh, head of the Senate Revenue Committee to come talk about local tax policy. Um, it'd be good, Mr. Mayor, if you have some time uh, in the next week, uh, towards the end of the next week, if you can give me some times that you might be available to meet with them, that'd be great. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Sal. Um, Kelly? Um, visit McMinnville. Uh, good meetings. Uh, several of the things that came up during the meeting uh, since we've been doing some planning. Uh, uh, we're going to be talking tonight about Airbnbs and additional revenue. Um, but also as a part of that, there's a tremendous amount of work they've been doing as far as free advertising, putting out like $3,000 that catches the eye of a much of a person that has much larger blogging ability or magazine ability and walking off with $100,000 worth of advertising. So the Visit Minfield does a good job with this. Uh, strategic placements. Um, Jeff is extremely good at uh, working on our overall placement with uh, Travel Oregon and the other surrounding DMOs. So I think he leverages us much higher than most uh, DMO administrators do. Uh, affordable housing, most of the discussion surrounded uh, what is happening uh, with the Housing Authority. Um, there is some discussion tonight. We are adding a new, we're adding a couple new, no, just one new member to this. Uh, what we're trying to get from the Housing Authority is um, a member that can, can do construction. So that's where we're at on those two committees. Uh, thank you, Kelly. Uh, from my perspective, um, uh, the Dundee, uh, Newburgh Dundee Bypass, we're meeting this coming uh, Thursday morning. Um, I had an opportunity to spend uh, uh, a part of the week before down in Medford with the Oregon uh, Mayor's Association, and um, we're able, we had approximately 85 mayors throughout the the state of Oregon there, and a great opportunity to network. A couple of things that were of significance from my perspective is um, the directors of the state, the state of Oregon departments are all there. And so you get to have a one-on-one, -on -one. you have to wait in line to do that, but an opportunity and uh, had an opportunity to um, meet with uh, an individual from ODOT um, the second in charge uh, as they're replacing and doing the things they're doing there um, and talking about the uh, Newburgh Dundee bypass and uh, just how slow that process is going. We've got money set aside and it just seems like we're not moving and I was able to get out of him that the, the bypass still isn't the kind of priority that we want it to be and so we'll be talking about that on um, Thursday morning, also received a call from our lobbyist consultant today, and uh, the OTC, the Oregon uh, Transportation Committee, has uh, significant dollars coming into them uh, through the feds mm -hmm. and to the state, and they're able to uh, earmark that, and uh, Newburgh Dundee Bypass isn't a part of that at all, so we're strategizing how we can get in front of the right people very shortly. Uh, they meet this coming Friday down in Ashland. So the ability to get down there is gonna be very difficult. Um, the one other piece that I was just very excited about um, when we were down in Medford, had an opportunity to visit a, um, um, what they're calling a urban campsite and uh, it's called Hope Village, and I brought material back, and I think Jeff's talked to Heather a little bit about that, but uh, today we canceled our countywide housing solutions meeting. Uh, 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 Commissioner Kula, uh, they ran over today. They had a, a large discussion there, so we canceled that, but I got some great information, I think, that could be beneficial to McMinnville in, um, uh, a design and an approach that's working very well in Medford, and so more to come from that as we as we talk about solutions uh, for uh, affordable housing in transition. Um, let's go ahead and from our department heads, uh, Chief. 
Yeah, real quickly, uh, Mayor and Council. Um, uh, we, I wanted to give a quick shout out to Parks and Rec for our, our um, partnership last week with National Night Out. I think it went well, uh, partnering with Concerts in the Park, which was a fabulous venue. Um, so that's fantastic. To piggyback on Councillor Garvin's uh, Airport Commission report, uh, we continue along with uh, the Fire Department and um, uh, other local agencies, Department of Justice, State Police, uh, plan the event for uh, International Air Show. It's going to be... Uh, We've got tremendous partners in this area, and I don't think that we mentioned that enough. State police has really stepped up, as have um, um, uh, the fire department, and I know Portland uh, Fire, uh, at least the the PDX, their their uh, airport department, fire department's uh, going to step up big. Uh, th that planning is going exceptionally well. Our staff is ready for it, and uh, we continue to meet weekly uh, as uh, as we move closer towards the end of September. Um, just graduated somebody from the academy, Cody Miller, on Friday. We're excited to get him. His dad is deputy chief of Salem Police, um, and we're excited to get him on board to have two in the academy. And we're working with uh, our HR department to onboard a couple more uh, from uh, retirement of Toby Carver, uh, retired after about 30 years, and then the pending retirement of Officer Harmon at the end of this year. So uh, busy time. We've got cruising McMinnville uh, the 24th. Uh, that we're prepping for and we'll be out and about for that one as well so a busy summer season of events and uh, we're managing that well with our staff stepping up to the plate so that's what i've got thank you chief kelly i know you're busy just a couple updates um to mayor and members of the council we have um, our classification and compensation project is underway uh you may recall a presentation a while back when we were at the community center. Um, so we've since selected a vendor. We're working with Gallagher Benefit Services. Um, we've kicked off the project. It's anticipated to last about another seven months or so. Um, all of our lovely employees are completing in-depth questionnaires about their work that they do. Thank you. <laughs> and um, we should have that project um, rolling right along and an update for you um, with a presentation as we get closer to the end uh, with the recommendations on, on what we might want to implement. Um, we also have entered into an agreement with NeoGov. It's an applicant tracking system. So all of our recruitments will soon be only online. Um, and I'm really excited about that. We'll kind of step that game up a little bit. Um, it'll help us be more consistent um, in our, with our candidates' experiences um, as applicants with us. Um, it'll also help us with our records management um, and just an improved experience for new hires as they start. They can get a lot of their paperwork that HR loves to have people fill out done before they get started. Um, we do have a really important holiday on Thursday I'd like to let you all know about. If you could grab your cell phones and get ready to take some City Hall selfies. Uh, <laughs> Thursday is City Hall Selfie Day. It's part of the Engaging Local Government Leaders Network. As your resident millennial, I feel like I have to like talk about that. Um, <laughs> City Hall Selfie Day is a day to promote engagement with your local government and to show civic pride. So if you have some time on Thursday, Feel free to swing by City Hall and snap a picture in front of there, um, and you can post it to any social media outlet with the hashtag City Hall Selfie. Thanks. Mark, you thank you. Me, Mark, Mark, you. <laughs> Marcia? Heather? Yes, yeah, so Mayor and Councilors, just one thing. Uh, tomorrow morning at 8.30, we have our third street streetscape improvement project advisory committee meeting. We'll be reviewing uh, the project charter, so vision, goals, objectives, and principles of the design. And then uh, we'll be working on the next phase of that project, which we'll be really looking at design and construction over the next two years. So, Thank you, Heather. Mike? Melissa? Jeff? Nothing to report. Thank you. Uh, a part of your packet is the cash and investment report and for your, your review. Uh, next takes us to our consent agenda for this evening. We have two OLCC requests. Uh, is there any counselor that uh, would request to have any items removed from our consent agenda? Hearing none, uh, I'll ask for a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. <coughs> So moved. Second. 
Second. Second. It's been moved by Wendy and seconded by Adam. All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, signify by saying nay. Uh, consent agenda passes unanimously five to zero. That takes us to our uh, resolutions this evening. Uh, we first will consider resolution 2019-56, a resolution authorizing the acquisition of property for the old Sheridan Road Improvement Project and exercising the power of eminent domain. And so I think we'll call on Mike to do that. Thank you, Mayor, members of the council. I'll refer you to the brief staff report that's in your packet from Project Manager Larry Sherwood. Also included is the vicinity map, which is shown on the screen. Uh, exhibit maps uh, regarding the acquisition of uh, three pieces of right-of-way and four temporary construction easements, um, as well as the draft resolution for your consideration. So this uh, particular resolution will authorize the acquisition of those three right-of-way parcels and four temporary construction easement parcels uh, to allow the construction of the Old Sheridan Road Corridor Project. We did recently have an open house that was well attended and uh, Larry Sherwood's done an excellent job of individual outreach to each of the properties along the corridor. So um, um, all of the property owners are aware that this process is moving forward. So unless there are any questions, I'd recommend that the council adopt the resolution as presented. Any questions for Mike? Were any concerns raised by the property owners affected? So uh, I was at the open house for the first hour and it was uh, pretty well attended um, and there weren't uh, concerns. There were a lot of questions. Uh, there'll be some public outreach as we move towards construction bidding. The, the biggest question will be uh, folks um, uh, understanding how we're gonna detour traffic while we need to be closed for three months to tear out the old bridge and build the new bridge. And so there are some detour routes that are planned that take uh, vehicle traffic on Cypress and Fellows and pedestrian traffic down Goucher. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll be doing a lot more public outreach as we get close to construction, which is planned for uh, next calendar year. It's about a six month project. But other than that, uh, I, I just offer that Larry's done an excellent job um, bringing the property owners along with this process and, and they were all fully engaged and informed before we had the open house. and. I've not heard any um, uh, substantive concerns that um, we're not able to address as part of the uh, develop design and construction package. Yeah, I know, um, you know, on Old Sheridan right now going east, you know, the, the traffic's queuing back <clears throat> almost to Goucher. And, and so there's going to be, I hate to say this, but some traffic calming when we expand and do the things that we need to do there. So uh, I know a few people that live down in that area and they're excited about the project. It's just the length and how long it's gonna to take to get to the finished product. Okay, um, any other questions? Mm -hmm. Hearing none, um, I will ask for a motion to approve resolution 2019-56. So moved. Second. Been moved by Zach and seconded by Kelly. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, signify by saying nay. Uh, this resolution 2019-56 passes five to zero. Thank you. Uh, the next resolution is uh, 2019 55, a resolution approving a lease uh, amendment and extension with Comcast of Oregon Incorporated. And so, Mike, I'll ask you to address this. Thank you, Mayor, members of the council. There is a very uh, brief staff report that I put together in the packet, as well as the proposed resolution and the uh, proposed lease amendment and extension document. Um, City Attorney Kosh was instrumental in negotiating the lease amendment and extension uh, when Comcast came to us asking for the lease extension, which is allowed under their current lease. They asked for modifications to the lease payment increase calculation section. Um, at the same time, uh, we have interest in uh, using um, uh, some of the parking uh, in their parking lot that they're not using. and. Um, uh, 
Uh, former engineering manager Rich Spofford and, and uh, City Attorney Kosh were able to work with Comcast to come to an agreement where we agreed uh, uh, in concept and in terms to uh, modification to their payment increase calculation, moving that from a CPI calculation to a fixed 2.5%. Uh, in exchange for the use of 20 parking spaces in their parking lot, which will greatly help with uh, some issues I'm dealing with uh, regarding parking within the fence of the uh, airport. Um, I was remiss, and I appreciate uh, a couple questions that Councilor Peralta had this afternoon. I was remiss in noting that the first year of the lease is actually represents a 7.5% 7 7 increase in their lease amount, uh, moving from $823 to $884.73 a month. Uh, that was uh, largely in part to uh, uh, City Attorney Kosh's um, um, work to try to bring us closer to market. Um, and um, I know uh, <clears throat> Councilor Peralta had one further question kind of late before the meeting regarding that amount. Um, and the distinction with uh, several of these airport land leases is we're just releasing land. We, that's their building. We don't own the building. Right. The building goes away when their lease ends. And so it's, it's purely a land lease. I contrast that to the OSP building, which we actually own the building and have to maintain the building. And it's a much different uh, lease price point for the city-owned facility versus just the land that we're leasing them. So that's this uh, lease amount, uh, especially when it moves to the 885 a month, is in line with the uh, land lease rates we've been using, um, uh, most particularly the pot cake uh, uh, aviation hangar that was just built. Uh, this price point um, is in line with uh, that lease that was just executed a couple years ago. So uh, City Attorney Kosh did bring us to market on the lease, and then we, uh, in exchange for the parking, we're agreeing to the fixed CPI for the, the remainder of the lease period. So unless there are any questions, um, uh, I'd like to thank David for his work, if he's still on the phone, and then uh, uh, recommend that the council adopt the resolution as presented. Thank you, Mike. Any further questions uh, for Mike? No, I just want to say, Mike, thanks for uh, answering those questions and uh, clarifying my uh, misunderstanding. So I'm comfortable with it. Good. Any others? If not, I will ask for a motion to approve resolution 2019-55. So moved. And second. Uh, second. It's been moved by Sal, uh, seconded by Kelly. All those who uh, are in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, uh, signify by saying nay. Ordinance number 2019-55 passes unanimously five to zero. That takes us to resolution 2019-52, a resolution amending the composition of the Affordable Housing Task Force. And so Heather, we'll turn that over to you to present. Yes, yeah, so um, Mayor, I'm going to present for both resolution number 2019-52 and 2-53. Um, at their last meeting, the Affordable Housing Task Force voted to recommend amending the um, makeup of the Affordable Housing Task Force to add a youth liaison. As you know, we've been trying to add a uh, youth member to all of our committees. We have had a youth coming to the last couple of meetings who's been providing valuable input and expressed an interest in participating, so we were good, look, happy to see that. Resolution 2019-52 adds the youth um, membership to the overall makeup of the task force and then resolution 2019-53 appoints Ethan McKay to be that youth member for the first three-year term. Hmm. He's a good kid. Any questions of Heather? Ethan has been attending the last couple of ones and has very insightful questions and brings a, a good perspective, I think, to the committee. So hearing no questions, let's go ahead and I'll ask for a motion to approve resolution number 2019-52. So moved. Second. It's been moved by Kelly and seconded by Wendy. <clears throat> All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Resolution 2019-52 passes unanimously five to two, or five to zero. Um, 
We are then now looking at the resolution 2019-53, a resolution appointing a member to the Affordable House Force, and, <coughs> and uh, Heather has already given that information to us, and um, the name Ethan McKay. Okay. McKay has been uh, nominated to, uh, to fill that to that term. Uh, so do I have a motion to approve? Is it, is it, can is we have two a people? discussion real quick? What's yeah. that? Is this for two people though? Ethan McKay and Vicki Yarberg? Just one. Just one. Oh, okay. Just one youth. But just yes, one youth. So my apologies. The, you should have gotten a revised packet notification oh, I'm looking at the yesterday, I believe. Um, we did revise the resolution 2019-53 originally. It had two members recommended. We currently have a vacancy as well for nonprofit housing provider. Um, as uh, Councillor Mankey indicated in her comments, um, there's interest in bringing someone online with development experience from one of our nonprofit housing partners because of the amount of money that's uh, being released by the state over the next biennium for development projects. Uh, but close to $400 million. We want to do all we can to support our partners to be able to access those funds and bring some projects into our community. Uh, we reached out to the Housing Authority. Uh, they recommended somebody to be on the task force. Um, not We hadn't indicated our preference in terms of development experience, and they recommended their finance director. We got back to the interim uh, executive director, who's the board chair right now, and said we'd like to have some further dialogue as we think it's it's pretty critical that we work on development projects. So um, the, the chair and vice chair make the recommendations to you, the city council, in terms of appointments. They have elected to pull uh, that f the finance director's application off the table for right now as they can continue to explore that. And the amended uh, res resolution is just for the youth appointment. Thank you, Heather. And so uh, resolution 2019-53 has the name of Ethan McKay, a youth to be appointed. All, uh, so do I have a motion to approve the resolution? Um, I have a question. Go ahead, Adam. So in his application, it says he's a high school graduate, um, but his term runs through 2022. So by definition of youth, they just need to be appointed while they're a youth and then they can serve out their term outside of being a youth and then somebody else is going to get appointed to a new term they could never have yeah, so two we, terms? What we haven't done is actually defined age thresholds for youth. Um, it, you'll see that in the previous resolution. We didn't do that. And we have looked at it as both high school and college opportunities. Okay. Thank you. Good clarification. Thank you. <laughs> anyway, so moved. <laughs> Okay, second. So it's been moved by Kelly and seconded by um, Zach. All in favor of approving resolution 2019-53, uh, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Indicate by saying nay. This resolution passes uh, unanimously five to zero. This takes us to our ordinances for this evening. Uh, we have the first reading with a possible second reading of ordinance number 5074, 5075, 5076, and 5077. Um, the next uh, four items um, are related to one development project that are separate land use decisions. If no one objects, I would suggest that we consider the first reading of all four of them at the same time and then the staff present on all four of them in one staff report. Uh, does any councilor object to having the ordinances read by title only? Hearing none, uh, then we'll have the city recorder uh, do the first reading of uh, 5074, and then we'll go 5075, 76, and 77. Melissa? This is the first reading of ordinance number 5074, an ordinance amending the comprehensive plan map designation of the property at 1901 Northwest Baker Creek Road from a mixture of commercial and residential to only residential. Uh, this is the first reading of ordinance number 5075, an ordinance amending the zoning designation of the property at 1901 Northwest Baker Creek Road from a mixture of R1 single family residential and EF80 exclusive farm use to only R1 single family residential. This is the first reading of ordinance number 5076, an ordinance amending 
an existing planned development overlay district to remove the property at 1901 Northwest Baker Creek Road from the planned development overlay district. So the first reading of ordinance number 77, an ordinance approving a conditional use to allow the expansion of an existing electrical power substation at 1901 Northwest Baker Creek Road. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, we'll now call on Senior Planner Chuck Darnell to present to us. Chuck. Thank you, Mayor and Councilors. Um, as Melissa just extensively shared, this is for uh, four ordinances for four land use requests for one uh, development project uh, at 1901 Northwest Baker Creek Road. Um, so this is the location of the site. It's the existing location of the Baker Creek substation owned and managed by uh, McMinnville Water and Light. Uh, just for a little bit of background of the history of the site, because it's what has led to the requests that are before you tonight. Um, the original substation lot, the existing lot, was originally annexed in 1977. Um, until that time, uh, there was a comprehensive plan map amendment conducted in 1996 uh, that changed half of the property and all the property to the west to commercial and adopted the plan development overlay district that still applies to the property today. Um, in 1999, there was a conditional use for the existing substation. Um, and then in 2008, the surrounding land around the substation was annexed in, uh, including a portion of the site as it exists today. Um, the site has expanded in terms of its property lines recently. Uh, Water and Light acquired the surrounding property as shown in that uh, graphic there to expand their property line that would allow for an expansion of the substation. Um, that property line adjustment expanded into further into the county zone uh, that exists around the site uh, from its previous annexation. Uh, so a condition of approval on the property line adjustment was that prior to development of the site, they bring the property into one comprehensive plan, map, designation, and one zone. Um, and that's actually required by our code, particularly because it's county zoning, which requires a rezone into an urban zone prior to any urban development occurring. Um, so that's what's led to the four requests that are before you tonight by the applicant, McMinnville Water and Light. Uh, so they're proposing to amend the comprehensive plan map from the mixture of commercial and residential to only residential, to uh, complete a zone change from the mixture of R1 and EF80 to just R1. Uh, as a result of those requests, they're requesting the plan development amendment to remove the property from the commercial plan development that exists on the surrounding property to the west, um, and then a conditional use to allow for the actual expansion of the electrical substation because it's a conditional use in the R1 zone. <laughs> Um, and just one point of clarification, typically a conditional use doesn't come to the city council, the final decisions by the planning commission, but because all four applications were submitted concurrently, uh, the code uh, requires that it go through the uh, process that it allows the most opportunity for review. So it's coming before you tonight uh, for your review and consideration. Uh, these are just some maps showing the proposal. Uh, the map on the left shows the existing comprehensive plan map. The map on the right shows what it would be if mm. the comp plan amendment was <clears throat> approved. Similarly, the map on the left shows the existing zoning and the map on the right shows the proposed zoning. Uh, so you can see that the majority of the site is actually uh, not in a urban city zone. It's in the county zoning from when it was annexed. Uh, this is the eventual proposed use of the site. Um, it's a little dark, but in the aerial, you can see the existing uh, equipment that's on the site today. They'd basically be duplicating that, doubling it, um, and expanding the substation. Um, looking through the comprehensive plan and zone change uh, review criteria, both of those are the same, uh, but they are two separate actions, but just touching on some of the key findings that are in the decision documents and the ordinances. I won't go through all of them in detail, but I'll just touch on some of the higher ones. Um, in terms of housing and residential development, uh, the proposal allows for that to continue by uh, increasing the electrical system in this area to support further growth and development of the residential and commercial land in the surrounding area. Um, in terms of the, the change from commercial to residential, um, there is a deficit of both commercial and, and residential lands that are most recently acknowledged, uh, economic opportunity analysis and uh, buildable lands inventory. Um, 
so the while you're taking away a small amount of commercial land you are still addressing a residential land need uh, and specifically uh, that r1 residential land need uh, that's identified in the, in the 2003 uh, buildable lands inventory and in, in that work there was an assumption that some of that residential land would be for infrastructure uses so that's what this would address as well um, there's also a number of comp plan policies about supporting um, energy and, and providing adequate uh, energy supplies for uh, the community as it expands. Um, some of the other comprehensive plan and zone change uh, criteria uh, call for the amendment to be orderly and timely and consistent with the surrounding development pattern, the surrounding area. Um, the consolidation of the lot into one comp plan uh, designation and zone really allows for better development of the site rather than the mixed uh, zones that apply to the site today. Um, and uh, going to that residential land and the R1 zone provides for the most opportunity for review of their eventual use, which is the expansion of the substation mm. um, as a conditional use instead of a potentially permitted use in one of our other zones. Um, so that's uh, why they've proposed the uh, land and zone that they have, and this map just kind of shows that the surrounding area is also guided for residential and it's not inconsistent with the surrounding area. Um, the plan development amendment uh, is an existing plan development amendment. Again, it covers the commercial area to the north and west. Um, the red area on the map there north of Baker Creek Road is the boundary of that plan development overlay. It was adopted in 1996 and um, again, it was commercial in, in its purpose and based on their request to go to residential, they wouldn't be developing to a commercial need anymore. So they're requesting to remove their site from the commercial PD um, and just reduce the size of that overlay. We've uh, included, a, and the Planning Commission has included a suggested condition to that all remaining um, st uh, standards and requirements of that PD would remain in place for the property that is still within the boundary. Um, and then finally uh, is the conditional use request for the actual expansion of the substation, which is the, um, what's driving the request before you tonight. Um, just again, the, the, the use is a conditional use in the R1 zone. Uh, I included a photo here of the site. This is not what it looks like today, but prior to some recent changes, uh, but this is basically what was a reviewed and approved as a conditional use back in 1999 for the existing facility. And then again on the right, it's showing that they're proposing to expand that and the equipment footprint uh, of the site. These are all the conditional use review criteria. I won't go through them in detail, but I'll just touch on some uh, that are more applicable. Uh, one is that it's consistent with the comprehensive plan. Uh, there's a number of policies, as I mentioned before, about energy systems, but also about how energy facilities are designed to be um, compatible with the surrounding area. Uh, so the applicant has um, proposed a site plan that includes some things that provide for some buffering and um, compatibility with the surrounding area. The site's expanding pretty significantly compared to what it is today in terms of where the boundaries are and the equipment is located. Um, the setbacks of the equipment is gonna be much more than it is today and they'll have a drive aisle around the outside so there will be some space between the equipment and the surrounding land uses. Um, and then they've also provided a landscape plan that they propose to provide some buffering and screening of the site around the perimeter. Um, it includes a wider landscaped area on the south side adjacent to Baker Creek Road uh, and then sidewalk and street trees where, where possible, uh, not able to do so in the BPA easement due to height restrictions of vegetation, but, um, and then in the surrounding areas around the perimeter having some landscape buffering space with both shrubs and trees around the perimeter of the site. Uh, Chuck, has this gone to the Landscape Review Committee yet? It hasn't. Um, so that's kind of typical with our conditional uses is we'll have, um, if there's a landscape plan, sometimes they'll be pr provided just to show the intent of doing so, but that the landscape plan itself will go to the Landscape Review Committee for their detailed review of the actual plant species and everything. That's a condition of approval that we're suggesting. 
Um, just to touch on some of the conditions of approval on the conditional use, uh, there are some related to infrastructure and utilities, uh, basically requiring that the Baker Creek Road uh, be improved uh, to our current city standards for that type of road. Uh, McMinnville Water and Light has already dedicated the necessary right of way and a public utility easement to allow for the widening of that street and sidewalk and planter strip along that north side of Baker Creek Road adjacent to their site. Um, we've included a condition number three to allow for coordination between the McMillan Water and Light and the surrounding property owner because they are in, um, have submitted for land use review for future development uh, just to minimize construction impacts in the surrounding area to allow for that coordination to occur if possible. And we put a time frame in there that is consistent with a agreement that McMinnville Water and Light already has with the surrounding property owner uh, in terms of a time frame of when that coordination could occur. Um, in terms of the site design and operation, some of the conditions that are included are to require landscaping consistent with the landscape plan that was submitted. So these things were already proposed by the applicant um, in terms of the site obscuring fence around the perimeter, uh, two rail fence uh, consistent with the south side of Baker Creek Road, that white uh, picket fence design, and then shrubs and trees around the perimeter. We did have some discussion with Water and Light and had some uh, amendments that the Planning Commission made to the condition to address security and operations the site uh, and so limiting the height of trees that are around it but still having some trees that provide a little bit of taller screen uh, of the site from surrounding properties. Uh, planting of street trees in the Baker Creek right of way and then just memorializing some of the lighting uh, practices and standards that the applicant proposed in their application. These things were proposed by them um, in terms of how the maintenance lighting and things like that operates to minimize uh, unnecessary lighting for surrounding residential uses. Um, the public meeting, neighborhood meeting process occurred. Uh, neighborhood meeting, there wasn't any public attendance at and the public hearing was conducted and um, there wasn't any public testimony received on that either. Uh, like I mentioned briefly, staff did work with McMinnville Water and Light staff on amending a couple of those conditions of approval based on their um, comments in terms of safety and functionality of the site uh, and some of their requirements that they have to meet for just electrical supply stations in general. Commission supported those, and those are the ones that are included in your packet tonight. Um, so, with that, uh, Planning Commission recommended approval of the four ordinances with the few conditions I mentioned tonight. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Chuck. Any specific questions for for uh, Chuck? I'll recognize we've got John and Scott and Sam in the audience from Mac Water and Light, and uh, they could also answer any questions you might have, but any anything? Yeah, Go ahead, was, Adam. I'll just mention there was a detailed analysis in the application materials and um, their electrical supply study that warranted the expansion of the site uh, here based on the loads of the surrounding areas and the cost effectiveness of this um, expansion of the site rather than a new site. I didn't mention that in my presentation, but there's a lot of information in the packet about that. Thank you, Chuck. Adam? As far as the size of the expansion, it's similar currently to the substation on West 2nd by visual size. Is it going to be triple that size, like, or nothing that we really see visually? Okay. That's similar to Ed Gormley substation out there off. Okay. Thank you for the context and thank you for the redundancy you're building into the system. Thank you, Adam. Any other questions? I just want to make a comment. Go ahead. That, uh, I appreciated all the detail in the report and um, both in the application and the report. It really um, gave a comprehensive view and I think it makes a lot of sense and I do also appreciate the redundancy in the system. I think it was clear that it's needed, so thank yeah, you. Yeah, I, I can just, from sitting on the commission, I can tell you that Mac Water and Light, when it comes to emergency preparedness and some of the things that uh, we may take for granted, they're really putting a proactive approach there, uh, putting the client number one and always being prepared. And this redundancy is going to be, I think, uh, a great um, addition to the system and therefore the benefit of the client. 
So, any other questions? Okay. Um, City Council has the opportunity to schedule a public hearing on this ordinance or to ask for a second reading of the ordinance. What is your pleasure? Go ahead, Zach. I'd be in favor of the second reading. Okay. I'd be in favor in the second reading. Okay. Then I will uh, ask uh, for a motion to uh, pass ordinance number 5074. The second. So moved. To a second reading. I guess we have to do all the second readings all individual, or can we do that all together? <laughs> Individually. Individually, okay. Um, okay, so we have a motion uh, for. Uh, I second it. Okay, so was it Adam? Yeah. 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 Okay. I haven't lost my mind yet. Adam and Kelly, uh, the, uh, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any. Uh, uh, any uh, <laughs> any opposed, please signify by saying nay. And so this ordinance number 5074 passes on its first reading unanimously. I will now ask the, ask the city recorder to read the ordinance again by title only. This is the second reading of ordinance number 5074, an ordinance amending the comprehensive plan map designation of the property at 1901 Northwest Baker Creek Road from a mixture of commercial and residential to only residential. Thank you, Melissa. I'll ask for a motion to adopt ordinance number 5074. So moved. Second. And a second. It's been moved by Sal and seconded by Zach. Uh, <coughs> ask the city recorder to poll the council. Melissa. Councillor Garvin? Aye. Councillor Geary? Aye. Councillor Peralta? Aye. Councillor Stassens? Aye. Council President Minky? Aye. Ordinance number 5074 is adopted by a vote of five to zero. Thank you. Uh, we'll ask for a motion to pass ordinance number 5075 to a second reading. So moved. Second. It's been uh, passed by Zach. And, uh, <laughs> seconded by Wendy. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed signify by saying nay. Uh, I will ask, uh, uh, well, ordinance number 5075 passes on the first reading unanimously. We'll now ask the city recorder to read the ordinance again by title only. This is the second reading of ordinance number 5075, an ordinance amending the zoning designation of the property at 1901 Northwest Baker Creek Road from a mixture of R1 single family residential and EF80 exclusive farm use to only R1 single family residential. Thank you, Melissa. I'll ask for a motion to adopt ordinance number 5075. So moved. Second. Uh, uh, adopted by Wendy. <laughs> Seconded by Zach. Um, I'll call on the city uh, recorder to pull the council. Councilor Garvin? Aye. Councilor Geary? Aye. Councilor Peralta? Aye. Councilor Stassens? Aye. Council President Minky? Aye. Ordinance number 5075 is adopted by a vote of uh, five to zero. Thank you. Uh, we'll ask for a motion to pass ordinance number 5076 to a second reading. So moved. Second. Um, uh, we had uh, Adam and uh, Sal. Um, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed signify by saying nay. Ordinance number 5076 passes on its first reading unanim unanimously. I will now ask the city recorder to read the ordinance again by title only. This is the second reading of ordinance number 5076, an ordinance amending an existing plan development overlay district to remove the property at 1901 Northwest Baker Creek Road from the plan development overlay district. Thank you, Melissa. Um, uh, I'll ask for a motion to adopt ordinance number 5076. So moved. Second. Uh, it's been... Uh, uh, Adopted uh, first motion by Wendy, second by Adam. Uh, I'll ask the city recorder to pull the council. Councillor Garvin? Aye. Councillor Geary? Aye. Councillor Peralta? Aye. Councillor Stassens? Aye. Councillor President Minky? Aye. Ordinance number 5076 is adopted by a vote of five to zero. Uh, I'll ask for a motion to pass ordinance number 5077 to a second reading. So moved. Second. 
and uh, moved by Zach and seconded by Adam. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 <clears throat> Any opposed by saying nay. Ordinance number 5077 passes its first reading unanimously. I will ask the city recorder to read the uh, ordinance by title only. This is the second reading of ordinance number 5077, an ordinance approving a conditional use to allow for the expansion of an existing electrical power substation at 1901 Northwest Baker Creek Road. Thank you. Uh, I will ask for a motion to adopt ordinance number 5077. So moved. Second. Been moved by Wendy and seconded by Zach. I'll ask the city recorder to poll the council. Councillor Garvin? Aye. Councillor Geary? Aye. Councillor Peralta? Aye. Councillor Sassens? Aye. Council President Minky? Aye. Uh, ordinance number 5077 is adopted by a vote of five to zero. Um, we now have the first reading with a possible second reading of, of ordinance number 5078. Um, does the council, uh, does any councilor object to having this ordinance read by title only? Hearing none, will the city recorder please read the ordinance into the record? This is the first reading of ordinance number 5078, an ordinance amending title two of the McMinnville Municipal Code, creating cap chapter 2.5, establishing a civil code enforcement process. Thank you, Melissa. Looks like we have uh, our uh, planning director, Heather Richards, here to present. And we've got our two cord, uh, uh, code enforcers with us uh, this evening. So, Heather, welcome. Thank you, gentlemen. It's great. <laughs> welcome, Heather. Sorry, I caught the chief doing this earlier. So I can't. <laughs> We'll put a little energy into this. Um, <laughs> so tonight, after a year, we're bringing to you our proposed code amendments for the McMinnville City Code for our code compliance program. So it's an exciting night. I was gonna say that Nick and Claudia have sat through a long meeting to get here, but they've actually sat through a much longer process to get here. So um, you have two ordinances in front of you. Um, one to amend the McMinnville City Code for a civil code enforcement process. One that will make, amend the McMinnville City Code for public nuisances, and then a resolution that's gonna create a code violation fee schedule. Uh, so ordinance number 507A adds chapter 2.50 to the McMinnville City Code. Ordinance number 5079 adds chapter 8.10 and then does a lot of cleanup. And then resolution number 2019-54 establishes code violation fees and adds them to the McMinnville fee schedule. So just to talk a little bit about the value of code compliance again, it, code compliance is really sort of the, the last piece to achieving our community vision, our goals and vision. We put together the plans, we put together a code to enact the plans, and then we need to ensure that the code is actually ab abided by. Um, and so that's where code compliance comes into place and it's really what gets us into a community. Um, we talked to you about a year ago about how we we're gonna set up a program where people could easily contact into code enforcement. Uh, so Nick and Claudia, and I'm sorry, I shouldn't introduce them, Nick Miles and Claudia Martinez, our code compliance officers. They put together an online complaint form. We also have a dedicated phone line uh, for people to call in with complaints, and that's a means of, of Nick and Claudia getting um, uh, complaints from the community. And then they're also very active in the community and they have their own dedicated uh, cell phones that they're handing out as well. The other thing that they've done proactively is they've established uh, sub areas in the community and, and are engaging in those sub, sub areas in different ways in terms of community relations with neighborhood associations and then also doing pro, proactive um, co-compliance. This is a snapshot of the cases that they have worked on over the past year to show you the types of nuisances that they're working on as, as, as they're working through the caseload. And then a snapshot of cases in terms of numbers. So overall, there's been about five, a little over 550 cases, and of that, they've closed 450 and about have, have about 100 that are active today. 
So in June, um, we started this effort when we uh, transferred the code compliance program from the police department to the planning department. And at that time, we made that decision to do that so that we could save resources um, in terms of the planning wasn't didn't have the staff capacity to do code compliance for planning and building. Um, and the police department was in a situation where they could restructure and um, pass the code compliance program on to planning by bringing it into planning. We were able to serve planning and building needs as well as the rest of the community and look at it from a, a community relations perspective and look at efficiencies. Um, we at that time said we're going to take it out of the court system and make it an administrative program. That was our goal uh, to create more efficiencies and timeliness for the community right now. Um, a, a tool in the toolbox, a final tool in the toolbox to get to abatement is citing someone into court and going through that process, which means that the officer has to be there, the judge is there, our city attorney's office is there. There's a, there's a whole bevy of people who need to be there to, to sort of follow that case through the court process. And if we brought it into an administrative program, we could make it much more streamlined and efficient for everyone. Uh, the goal is voluntary compliance, though. And so we do that with education, with information, with communication, and with relationships, and Nick and Claudia do that really, really well. Uh, where there will be times when we won't achieve voluntary compliance, and that's when we need some tools uh, to achieve it. And so um, those are the code violation fees of so writing administrative citations um, at, or abatement where the city does go in and abate the nuisance and, and then goes for full cost recovery and collections and liens if necessary. So we said we would evaluate the codes for the current Minville Municipal Code for nuisances and code compliance issues, that we would amend it to create this administrative code compliance process, that we create a, a centralized program in the development planning, planning department and then develop a community relations program. In February of this year, we brought to you proposed code amendments. At that time, counselors asked us some questions about the, the nuisance code relative to bees, which is a little awkward because what it, what it does is it says bee colonies are allowed in McMinnville, but under these circumstances, and then it spells out how they're allowed. And then if you're not following those that particular structure, then it's a nuisance, a public nuisance. Um, at that time, after reviewing it, and then we also a question about construction debris and how to sort of put that into an ob objective standard so that we could enforce it. After receiving those comments from council, we uh, got the direction to move forward. We did have department head review, and then it went into uh, legal review. And uh, once it went into legal review, uh, David restructured it because he, he's working on a comprehensive program in terms of how he wants the McMinnville Municipal Code to serve the community in the future, and felt that this was a good foundation for putting that together. So that's why you see the additional chapter 2.5, which will serve the whole city and all of its programs in terms of enforcement process and then the nuisance code. So it's, they've been separated out that way. Uh, so the structure of the code, it's the intent is to simplify it, uh, to aggregate the nuisances in one place. So you'll see a lot of deletions that are part of the uh, recommended uh, ordinance as well so that we can bring things together. They're in several different chapters right now. To have this standardized abatement process, we have a process prescribed for many different nuisances rather than just a standard process. And then to allow for the code compliance officers to issue citations. Um, we reviewed the existing code, we modernized it. I shared with you in February that there's code language in there from the 50s and the 40s. Uh, we researched best practices, so Nick and Claudia have been um, really building a network amongst other Oregon code enforcement uh, personnel, attending training both on state level and national level, um, and reaching out for best practices. We met with the judge of the court to talk about what's working, what's not working in the court system, and and then how to have a relationship moving forward because there's still an opportunity to go into a court system. That's a process allowed for um, somebody who's in the abatement process if they want to appeal after they get past a certain level. 
um, they can go into a civil appeal. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that we were putting the evidentiary file in place in such a way that it could serve that process if we needed to defend the city appropriately. Uh, so we met with the judge to talk about that and also about administrative warrants so that we could do the abatement. We amended the code for objectivity. So how do we get to a place where we can say, this is a nuisance, it's not a nuisance. Um, an example of that is we get a lot of uh, complaints about barking dogs. <laughs> and Claudia and Nick have to you know, go through a process right now of sort of deciding is it at the level that it's a nuisance or not, and there's no sort of performance metrics in the code, so it's somewhat discretionary. And the proposed amendments, you'll see that there is actually a performance metric of 10 minutes. If, the do if your dogs are outside barking for 10 minutes and someone complains, then that's a means of, of saying there's evidence that it is a nuisance and then it had the legal review. So in terms of process, just really quickly, chapter 2.50, the added chapter for process, uh, is all about compliance in a timely manner. We've had some code compliance cases go through the court system over a three-year period until we got to a place of abatement. We're really looking at a 21-day test. So we're trying to set up a program that has a 21-day um, compliance period associated with it. The first 10 days is voluntary compliance, so Nick and Claudia will communicate with the property owner, let them know that we've received a complaint, um, and give them the opportunity to bring the property into compliance. Or there, we also have uh, written into the process that they can call and say, you know, I can't do it in 10 days, but this is how I can do it, and my contractor can't come until, you know, this date or whatever it is. But at least Nick and Claudia know they're moving forward and achieving milestones, and they can put them into a compliance process plan. If there isn't voluntary compliance within 10 days, then Nick and Claudia have the opportunity to say, you really need to do this. And they can move into a citation process. So we've given you 10 days to do it. You've shown that you're not willing to do it. And then they can start writing the citations um, to sort of put a little more oomph behind there um, to try and get it done in the next 10 days. And then by day 21, if it's not done, they can go in and abate it themselves. Use vendors to go in and abate the property. Um, and then we'll go into a full cost recovery process. By the city abating it, it's much more expensive for the property owner because we will add on our administrative costs associated with handling that abatement. Um, and then it could also go into a lien process against the property. So typically we don't, uh, I've been working in code enforcement for about 15 years. You don't see a lot of properties go into an abatement process that the city does, um, but it is a tool that many city use. Chapter 8.10, the nuisance chapter, what we did there um, outside of streamlining it, making it more user friendly, you'll see it's alphabetized. We brought fence codes, which we had in three different portions of, of the McMinnville Municipal Code into this one place in the nuisance chapter. We consolidate all the animal codes. We had animal codes throughout the um, the city code in different chapters, and we brought it all into this one. We added metrics to the unnecessary noise uh, section of, of the code. We added a section in there on parking and storage of vehicles in front yards and side yards. So right now, we're getting a lot of complaints about vehicles being the front yard, the grass seated front yard being used as a driveway um, or a parking lot for different uh, properties. And so we did add a section in there which says, you know, you can expand your driveway section. There is a way to do it, and this is how you do it. it it's not your whole front yard, though. Um, and so that's new for McMinnville. We added a section on trash recycling and yard debris containers based on a request from Recology. And then just recently, the last couple of weeks, we added a section on graffiti. Um, because of there's been an increased amount of graffiti nuisances in this community, um, and we're getting a lot of complaints about them, and we felt we needed to put it into a nuisance process, which is a, a typical process for many communities. There are two amendments I'd like to bring to your attention tonight. So there's been a lot of restructuring in this code, and. Um, and in the last couple of days, uh, we have found two amendments uh, that we'd like to, to bring to your attention in section 8.10.260E. So this is under noise and it's under prohibitions. So meaning that these elements are not, do not have to abide by the noise nuisance code. Um, what we wanna do is currently it reads activities occurring within the scope of any permit issued by the city under the provisions of the McMinnville city code. I, we issue a lot of building permits, which we actually don't want to be 
exempted. They do have to fall under a certain time frame for the noise provisions. And so we are uh, suggesting a um, added language that, that says exempting a use from this section of the McMinnville City Code. So activities occurring within the scope of any permit exempting a use. And that would be when someone comes to City Council, which I, we've seen a couple of times, where they want to have a large event to 10 p.m. and you issue that permit specifically for that. Um, the second thing we want to do is, and, and actually I was just visiting with Mike about this before he left, is our construction vehicles, our street sweepers, and some other construction vehicles that are used in public works may exceed the um, noise decibel level that we're putting in there. So that's the performance metric that we put into the noise so we can um, have the objectivity. Uh, they, the street sweeper will exceed that, so he wanted to make sure that he's not falling out of compliance. And then there are times when, um, per the city manager and, or the designee, that we are doing construction in the public right away after hours hours or we're sweeping downtown after hours um, and so there currently uh, there's a, a limitation in terms of the exemption in terms of time frame what I'd like to do after I had originally recommended that we reverse the time and say between 8 p.m. and 7 a.m. I think what I would like to recommend to you tonight is that number three just read the prohibition is meaning that it's, it's exempt from the nuisance code for noise. Vehicles performing repairs of upgrades in the right of way, including but not limited to street sweeping, sewer cleaning, construction and maintenance activities occurring authorized by the city manager or designee. So get rid of the hours altogether. And what that means is the city manager has said either you can work after hours in the right of way or I've, I've um, given the authority that the street sweeper that exceeds the noise decibel level can operate in the right of way. So I'm sorry for the confusion on that, but we wanted to make sure our equipment could continue yeah, to serve the I think we received an email, uh, I think all the counselors, that someone thought that construction could now go until 8 p.m. <laughs> Uh, if I read that correctly, I don't know if you guys saw that that came in this afternoon, but there was a concern that why would we allow construction? Well, it can go to, to right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So currently in the code, it can go to 8 p.m. today. Now, before the amendment, actually there's conflicting pieces of the code okay. um, in terms of that. We have it in two different places. So what we're recommending is, is that we bring it into one place here and that it is 8 p.m. That is what's in the code today. So we're not changing that, we're just consolidating. consolidating. What's the 6 p.m. code that they cited that's currently in there? Was that miscited? That's the conflicting code. So it, and is it six or seven? I thought it was seven. There was an hour difference. There was a code passed earlier in the 60s that was 7 p.m., and then there was another code passed in the 70s, 70s, is that right? That was, that's 8 p.m., um, and we had someone come in and complain about it. David did a legal review. He felt that based on the most recent code that it, it superseded the previous code that so 8 p.m. was the time frame in which we were operating and have historically operated for the last three decades, okay. four or five decades. Um, and so we just wanted to clean all that up. And what's best practices in, as far as uh, statewide as other cities? Are they typically 8 p.m. or 7 p.m. or no weekends, it, no holidays? Um, do, you, do you guys have? I don't know. No. I know in Redmond we let them go uh, later than 8 p.m. because we were working within a window of, of constructability seasons and daylight, right? Um, and so I, th I think that's relative to each community. But the same is actually true here in many regards, rainy season versus dry season, and you'll see a lot of contractors trying to get their work done during the daylight hours of the dry season, the exterior work. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the code violation fee, so this is new for McMinnville. We haven't done this in the past. This is, uh, did you have a question about the exemptions? Well, I just had, I, I had a couple of comments on, and I can wait till the end of your presentation. Okay. If this is, I'm almost there. Okay. Um, 
So this is new for McMinnville. This is this is a tool in the toolbox. So bringing it into, we no longer are using the threat of citing into court um, because that's not efficient. Um, and so this is a tool in the toolbox for Nick and Claudia to use to gain compliance by having this fee structure. This is fairly typical. Um, and what we wanted to do is have a broad range. So this is this will be used for many other aspects of the of the city code uh, in terms of gaining compliance. Most of the nuisance codes have a violation of about $250. The most exorbitant one is $1,000. And it's really relative to public safety and hazards and uh, in terms of trying to gain more immediate compliance. And that, that will be part of the fee schedule, not part of the code, so we can change it by resolution if we need to do so. And then it also dovetails with um, the, the civil violations as well. And that is concludes our presentation. Thank you, Heather. <laughs> uh, questions for the team? So I had a couple. I mean, first, um, really great job on putting all of that together. And how, mu how much of that was substantially rewritten from what you had previously? Was it a lot of... So I will say, David's the one who rewrote it. <laughs> I rewrote was originally in the code and brought best practices together. That's what we brought to you in February. David then took my simpleton language and rewrote it into legalese. There's a lot of SAT words in there that, that we were like, huh. But uh, <laughs> uh, So David rewrote it from what you saw in February. So, so the two takeaways that I had, the first is that um, having just constructed a fence at my house <laughs> earlier this year, I appreciate the greater flexibility in terms of the three foot height restriction. You make it, um, you can go yeah. a little more flexible if there's a good line of sight. I think yeah. that is a good. And that's been a practice. So we, in the last six months, we've been practicing that because we've gotten a, with the transient population issue in this community, we've had a lot of people who have been um, ang anxious about safety issues yeah. with their properties and so we've been working through that well for my issue it was that our dogs can jump a three-foot fence yeah and we heard that a lot too yeah. fence. so uh and then the second question that i had is um you have a there's we have in the city code uh restrictions on um leafleting commercial leafleting of cars and residences mm -hmm. and i question whether that's actually a lawful restriction um did david do any analysis on whether or not that's actually legal to restrict um, that type of speech? So it, it shouldn't be the speech. It should be just like signs. It should be the, the, um, the method of distribution of the information. So right, but, but leafleting on cars, at least for political purposes, is protected speech. Um, and I suspect that there might be similar protections for commercial speech. So I'm, I'm skeptical about whether or not that's enforceable. Uh, I can ask him about that. I'm, I'm pretty sure we had the same we had the same code in Redmond and mm -hmm. practiced it there. Okay. Um, but we can bring that concern to him. It's for any vehicle that's parked in the public right away. Mm -hmm. If you could uh, if you could check with him on that, because I'm I'm not sure if that's. Um, I'd, I'd like. Yeah, to we'd all like to know on that one. <laughs> But otherwise, it, I thought it, it was it great. It could be that political, uh, actually, I honestly don't know. I'll ask him. Thanks. OK. Any other questions or comments? Yeah. Go ahead, yeah. Zach. OK. Um, good work. Thank you. I like the 21-day program. It's uh, effective. And uh, hopefully, it, it leads to you guys um, getting people to comply. Um, I have a question if you could describe for me the what you outlined in 2.50.120, the notice of code violation to be posted on the premises. Can you tell me that process a little bit more? What does that look like? So uh, what we are planning um, once it passes, um, so right now we're receiving the complaints. We go and um, speak with the resident or um, whoever the property belongs to. Um, if that doesn't work, then we send an official notice and mm -hmm. then we send out a certified letter if they don't come into compliance within 10 days. Um, posting the property would be either door hangers or something that would stick on the door um, that would be considered posting. Um, and I think that would be um, more effective for vacant properties. So that's in lieu of sending a letter or you do all of those things? 
No, we would. Uh, it, it would pretty much. It would depend on what we think would be best. But um, what we will do first is um, speak with the with the resident. If we're unable to get in contact with them, then we send a letter. Um, and, and this will allow us to send a letter or post it, um, especially, like I said, when there's vacant properties, we would be able to post it. But we would um, do or one or the other. Or I'm going to actually interject. We could do both. So it's building the evidentiary file. This is part of building the evidentiary file. And there are property owners. We have to notify the property owner legally. That's who mm -hmm. we'll be leaning if we go into abatement process and we collect and we don't receive funds. So they have to be notified of the nuisance and the ability to bait it themselves. Um, there are times when the property owner, one, either is not receiving their mail or refuses to acknowledge they receive their mail, or if they get a certified letter or they have to sign for it and they refuse to sign for it. So then there's, they can come into the, to the system and say, I never received notice. By posting the property with either a sign or a door hanger, that will be dem demonstrative of, of providing notice that they should have seen. It, it stands up in the court system if it's as evidence of notice. So at what point in the process if you receive, if they refuse to acknowledge their receipt, then do you public notice or do you, do you post notice? So, so my suggestion is when we get to the 10 days and we do the certified letter that we would also post the property okay. if we haven't already done so. Okay. Excellent. Uh, and then another question, is it, am I reading that right, that you guys will make a recommendation on the class of violation and that comes to council for approval and assignment or how does... Did I read that right or wrong? No, so the, the code right now has the class of violation relative to the, the civil violation fee schedule. The code itself already has that in there. So in the, in the 2.50 process, which is meant to serve all programs in, in the city, right now you have chapter eight, which is the public nuisance code coming to you for um, adoption. That will be your decision, right? Written into that code is exactly what code violation that each nuisance is. And for instance, for future code amendments as we go into code enforcement, so the development code, we're going to go through the development code, chapter 17, and review it and identify um, violation fee uh, penalties in there too. And we'll bring that back to you as an amendment so that's your decision as a city council, if you adopt that, that you're going to say, if there's a dangerous sign that's a hazard to public safety and it's out of code compliance, maybe Maybe that's the 2500 code violation, right? right? We assign that in the code. So your vote and action to adopt the code is your decision-making process for that. And I think David's setting that up so we can do that in other aspects of the code as well. <clears throat> Did that answer it? Yes. Yeah. And then 8.10.260 8 8 noise and then subsection C. Um, is there a time limit? You talk about decibels. Is there a time limit also for the decibels or is it just merely the achievement or ex exceeding of any of those decibel levels? Is it a violation or is it subject? Some of them have time limits. So like okay. the barking dog issue yep, and, yep. and some of them are exceeding the decibel level. Just, okay. Okay. Those are my question. Oh, yeah, you Thank you. Your time's in there. Actually, um, I have we'll a follow-up follow follow question to the decibel question. Um, <laughs> what is the... Can you describe, I know that we talked about this um, when there was, uh, we had a drive um, through that was coming in near the West Hills community and there was a lot of conversation about how the decibels are measured and how you provide evidence of that. In a case where you get a nuisance complaint, how do you then, what's the method for determining if that level of decibels has been exceeded? Like so we're, we will have to outfit both Nick and Claudia with, uh, with a tool for measuring decibels. There are, <coughs> there are actually tools that you can download onto your telephone software or you could have a separate tool as well. Um, they will use that as evidence. So it's written into the code, you have to be standing a certain amount of feet away, you then measure the noise. If, you, if, it, if the, it exceeds a decibel level, you can, you can screenshot that or whatever it is. Okay. And then so that's- The individual could with- have that same thing in screenshot. Yeah, so if they, that you guys so if I'm a neighbor and I'm complaining can... about it, about something, typically what happens is a neighbor uh, 
uh, somebody will complain. Um, we find it's a lot of neighbor on neighbor issues, but um, somebody will complain about a, a code violation. And then it's our job one to investigate it. So the first thing is investigation uh, and evidence gathering to see if it's actually is a code violation. And then if it is a, a, deemed a code violation, then we go into the process of notification and abatement. Okay. So somebody can you know, measure it themselves and send that to us. The question would be, and this might be something for us to follow up with David on, is I've always had our officers go out and if, if somehow affirm that that, that that screenshot actually worked for that time or try to find a way to find out if it's a reoccurring event that they can get that. Yeah, okay. Um, and then the only other question I had was what kind of feedback have you been getting from the community? You guys have already been had more focus than we have had in the past. Have you been getting specific feedback from the community about their response to that, like positive or, or like constructive criticism with regards to how they're responding? To, to noise to, specifically? or No, to um, code compliance specifically, just any code compliance. Are you getting uh, pushback or people? Uh, there's been a lot of educating going on for sure. It's a lot of, you know, Claudia and I are going out. We're, we're trying really hard to make our first contact with folks to be in person so that we can share the code with them and, and to treat them as though they didn't know that it was mm -hmm. a violation. Mm -hmm. And I think that's been really effective. A lot of people are unaware that the, these codes even exist. Mm -hmm. So we've been focusing a lot on that in the last 12 months. Um, I think the, the word has spread pretty quickly. It's snowballed, so I think people are starting to share with their neighbors what they can and can't be doing and what they've learned. Um, so it feels like it's spread pretty organically and, nice. and has been well received. Nice. And people are grateful to have someone to, you know, come out and take care of it. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Good job, you guys. Thanks, Wendy. Any comments down, Adam? Uh, yeah, I have a few. Um, I guess it, we'll start with the noise. So it says after 8 p.m., like, leaf blowers can't be used, so technically a resident couldn't mow his yard after 8 p.m. Am I reading that correctly? Mm -hmm. um, and then storage of motor vehicles. It says non-erodible surfaces, but only mentions asphalt, concrete, and pavers, so somebody couldn't use, like, three-quarter inch minus to provide parking space for their vehicles, is that correct? Yeah, so what, what we have, it shouldn't be exclusive. Which number is the, that you're reading from for that? Uh, that was 8, 10, 250. Okay. And I believe. That, that is probably for the front yard piece, right? For the purposes of the section. Yeah, I think it's number C. Oh yeah, there we go, it's D. Yeah. Um, so consisting of, uh, do, 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 okay, so non-erodible. So what we're trying to do is um, in old codes, like our zoning code right now, <laughs> we describe what you can and cannot do, but it doesn't allow for evolution of anything. So if it's not on the list, it's not on the list. So what we're trying to do moving forward is put intentional statements in there. So if someone can come in and show it's a non-erodible surface, we're fine with that. Okay. Um... 230 talks about weeds and vegetation. And if it's over 10 inches at any point of the year, I mean, is it, so that would include like somebody that lets their garden overgrow in the winter and then they prep it in the spring. So they have over 10 inch weeds, they could be fined 250 per day. Or they can take care of it. So the first 10 days is you get notice and you take care of it. The other thing to remember, it's if it's view, if it's one, you can view it from the public right away or your neighbor complains about you. Okay. We're not entering people's backyards to inspect their backyards. Okay. How I read it was if there's, if it's not gated or the gate's not locked that you guys could legally enter the backyard. That's how I read the code. That's not correct. Mm -mm. Um... <laughs> <laughs> I was just And it's not practiced that way either. <laughs> well, I, I'm well aware of that with current staff, but when you're enacting policy, you need to consider all factors. Um, excavations and open pits. So that was... 
hole deeper than three feet or a top width of more than 12 inches. So if a contractor is prepping or somebody's prepping their landscape for some mature trees, I mean, you could easily get a root ball that's outside of that. And that's technically a violation if it's not filled in within 10 days and they would be fined. Yeah. Yeah, and the intent of that is that's actually it's a safety hazard. That's a pretty common one in most codes. That's that's actually a model code language. Um, one forty attractive nuisances. Also another safety one. The way I interpreted it, but it just seems very vague in how it's written. Um, Like number four, containers accessible to children that are more than one cubic foot uh, that has a door or lid that locks or fastens when closed that cannot be easily opened. In my eyes, I would see a 90-gallon recycling cart that has a wind lock on it that you can't get open from the inside. Is that so somebody or something of that nature? I mean, somebody could easily get that fine racked up if we didn't have great code compliance officers like we do currently. Yeah, so for instance, your example, a, a child, it's so again, it's the, sort of the evidence of the nuisance, right? So if the recycling container is locked, then the child can't access it and get in it. If the, if the recycling container is not locked, so typically this is like refrigerators that are outside and freezers mm. and things of that nature. So if I can get into it, but I can't get out of it, that's the issue. Okay. Um, I think that was it for my notes. Sal or Kelly? No, nope, I'm good, thanks. Good job, you guys. Again, a lot of hard work on everyone's part. Okay, um, so I think we are now to a point where um, I'll ask for a motion Pass ordinance number 5078 to a second reading. So moved. Oh, second. Okay. So we have uh, Zach and Wendy. Um, all those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, indicate by saying nay. Okay. Ordinance number 50. 78 passes on its first reading unanimously. I'll ask the city recorder to read the ordinance by title only. This is the second reading of ordinance number 5078, an ordinance amending title two of the McMinnville Municipal Code, creating chapter 2.50, establishing a civil code enforcement process. Thank you, Melissa. I'll ask for a motion to adopt ordinance number 5078. So moved. <laughs> and a second? Second been uh, uh, moved by Kelly and seconded by Zach. I'll ask the city recorder to pull the council. Councilor Garvin? Nay. Councilor Geary? Aye. Councilor Peralta? Aye. Councilor Stassens? Aye. Council President Minky? Aye. Ordinance number 5078 uh, is adopted by a vote of four to one. Thank you. Um, First reading, we'll consider the matter of ordinance number 5079. Does any councilor object to having this ordinance read by title only? Hearing none, will the city recorder please read the ordinance into the record? This is the first reading of ordinance number 5079, an ordinance amending titles 8, 9, and 17 of the McMinnville Municipal Code relating to public nuisances. Thank you. Uh, Heather, would you present? <laughs> Oh, that, that's this. That's chapter eight, the public nuisances. I can present again, <laughs> but I'm trying to save time. <laughs> so we're just d doing each section. Um, I just follow script. <laughs> any any questions about the nuisance portion? Hearing none, I'll ask for a motion. Uh, well, let me back up. Uh, no, I'll ask for a motion to pass ordinance number fifty seventy nine to a second reading. So moved. Second. Been moved by Zach and seconded by Wendy. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, indicate by saying nay. That passes unanimously. Um, uh, ordinance number 5079 passes by a vote of, excuse me, 
uh, ordinance number 5079 passes on the first reading unanimously. I will ask the city recorder to read the ordinance again by title only. This is the second reading of ordinance number 5079, an ordinance amending titles 8, 9, and 17 of the McMinnville Municipal Code relating to public nuisances. Thank you, Melissa. Ask for a motion to adopt number uh, ordinance number 5079. So moved. And second. a second. Second. Been moved by Zach and seconded by Wendy. Ask the city recorder to poll the council. Councilor Garvin? Nay. Councilor Geary? Aye. Councilor Peralta? Aye. Councilor Stassens? Aye. Council President Minky? Aye. Ordinance number 5079 is adopted by a vote of four to one. Considering um, resolution number 2019-54, resolution adopting a code violation civil penalty schedule. Uh, we've had a discussion. Any further questions on that? If not, I'll ask for a motion to approve resolution 2019-53. So moved. And a second? Second. It'd been, it's been moved by uh, Kelly and seconded by Wendy. Uh, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, please signify. Okay, uh, resolution number 2019-54 passes unanimously uh, or is adopted unanimously uh, by a vote of five to zero. First reading with possible second on ordinance 58, uh, 50, um, Does any counselor consider the matter or does any counselor object to reading this ordinance by title only? If not, um, will the city recorder please read this ordinance into the record? This is the first reading of ordinance number 5080, an ordinance amending the McMinnville Municipal Code chapter 5.10, provisions related to the lo local transient lodging tax. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, Marcia, if you would present. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor and Councilors. Uh, I would direct you to the staff report that's in your packet. Uh, this action in front of you tonight is to consider ordinance number 5080, which amends sections of chapter 5.10 of the McMinnville Municipal Code. This is the chapter for local transient lodging tax. The amendments that are in this ordinance 5080 uh, that are in front of you tonight are intended to uh, reflect recent legislative changes relating to the collection of transient lodging taxes and to ensure that online companies and hosting platforms are properly collecting and remitting that tax uh, to the city. As you know, there's more and more people who are renting their homes out as vacation home rentals or short-term rentals. Uh, as a matter of fact, we actually have 64 vacation home rentals registered in the city right now. And many of the people who are renting their homes are, are using um, uh, online companies such as Airbnb or VRBO, um, and there are many others. So also, as you probably know, when you, uh, a guest might rent a property through Airbnb, they make the payment directly to the online company and not to the owner of the property, not to the lodging provider. So that makes it more difficult and more complicated for the city to be able to ensure that we're collecting the proper tax on those rentals. Um, so to address that, back in 2013, the Oregon legislature passed House Bill 2656, and that added the term transient lodging intermediary to ORS 320.300. So the tra terminology transient lodging intermediary was added to the law to specifically um, address online travel companies who were um, collecting the tax uh, from the guest. And so as a result of this House Bill 2656 and the addition of the language transient lodging intermediary, uh, we didn't begin actually receiving transient lodging taxes from, uh, right now we're getting um, transient lodging taxes from nine of these intermediaries, and that includes uh, VRBO, Hotels.com, Hotwire, Priceline, 
So at that time, we did actually start to receive uh, transient lodging tax from, from many of those companies. However, there were some companies that argued that they were not transient lodging intermediaries or tax collectors because they only facilitated the transaction between the guest and the lodging provider or the property owner. Um, they said that because they were not a transient lodging intermediary, did not meet that definition, they were not required to collect the tax and turn it over to the, the government, either the state or the, the local government. So to really try to address this issue of the companies that were arguing that they were not transient lodging intermediaries, um, the League of Oregon Cities has provided a model ordinance for transient lodging taxes, and they recommend that there is specific language in uh, the local government's ordinance uh, that um, comes from House Bill 4120. And if you look at the staff report in the uh, discussion section at the top of the second page, that language that the LOC is recommending is included in Ordinance 5080. Uh, that language is uh, states that transient lodging intermediaries charge for occupancy of the transient lodging collect the consideration charged for occupancy of the transient lodging, receive a fee or commission, and require the transient lodging provider to use a specified third-party entity to collect the consideration charged for the occupancy. So again, Ordinance 5080 includes that specific language and would amend our uh, Chapter 5.10 to include that language. Uh, there are some other changes that you'll see in this ordinance, and um, our city attorney had actually taken advantage of this change that we were making and gone through the entire ordinance and had better aligned it with um, the model policy that the LOC has given us and uh, has it really better reflects um, the recent legislative changes and uh, best practices. Um, I would also say that I uh, have been in contact with a number of different finance directors and, and uh, LOC specifically um, referred to the city of Corvallis that has this language in their ordinance <coughs> and that they actually have been successful in collecting this tax from a company that has not been willing to do that in the past. Uh, and then in... Uh, Chapter 5.10.190 penalty, which is at the very end of the ordinance, you'll see that one of the changes um, uh, is about the penalty for not complying with the ordinance. Uh, lodging providers or tax collectors that have violated the provision of the chapter may be assessed a civil penalty pursuant to chapter 2.50, which is what Heather was just referring to. Uh, I believe you, there is one change to the ordinance that's in front of you tonight that is different than the ordinance that was um, in the packet that you received. Uh, this is se uh, section 5.10.010.G, that's in the definition section of the ordinance. And this is the definition of occupant. And um, we have changed the definition to say that the occupant means any individual who exercises occupancy, um, et cetera. Um, however, uh, as uh, Councillor Peralta uh, suggested to us, that by using the word individual, that was actually fairly narrowly, uh, a, a fairly narrow term, because if you look below in section M, which describes person, um, that person is very, that definition of person is very broad and all inclusive. So we would like our uh, definition of occupant to mean any person instead of any individual. So that's the reason for that one word change in this ordinance that's in front of you tonight. Um, are there any questions on that? Any questions for Marsha? Hearing none, um, 
I will ask for a motion to pass ordinance 5080 to a second reading. So moved. Second. It's been- As amended. As amended. Go ahead. No, as you need as to amend We have the- Oh, a, as amended, okay. Uh, it's been uh, moved by Zach and it was seconded by Adam? So. Sal. Or Sal. Um, those uh, in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed signify by saying nay. <laughs> Ordinance number 5080 passes on its first reading unanimously. I will now ask the city recorder to read the ordinance again by title only. This is the second reading of ordinance number 5080, an ordinance amending the McMinnville Municipal Code chapter 5.10 provisions related to the local transient lodging tax. Thank you, Melissa. Um, I will ask for a motion to adopt ordinance number 5080 moved second. and uh, it's been moved by Adam and seconded by Sal. I'll ask the uh, city recorder to poll the council. Councilor Garvin? Aye. Councilor Geary? Aye. Councilor Peralta? Aye. Councilor Stassens? Aye. Council President Minky? Aye. Uh, ordinance number 5080 is adopted by a vote of five to zero. Um, that takes us to the end the conclusion of our meeting this evening. Any other items? Seeing none, I'll go ahead and adjourn the meeting. So the reason that I asked for that is because the way they drafted it. Is oh, yeah. Corporation. We did. We got it. wasn't a fighter under a